buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, so I'm going to go over a couple of comments here. Um, well, I'll just go over one. All right, Vonda Berry Man uh, has a very nice comment here, but uh, this person says, I seem to be confused, and but then never tells me what she thinks I'm confused about. So I appreciate these comments. Now, this one's uh, particularly interesting by 77 Saint 77 Post Trib. And he says, you said what? Anyone that says there is salvation after Jesus returns? Question mark, question mark. Matthew 28, verse 15. Abomination of desolation is the revealing of Antichrist. Daniel 9, verse 27. Uh, I can't even begin to think or to imagine how you are coming to that conclusion. All right, so let's go to that verse. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now that's interesting. That's very interesting. Then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So let's get some parallels here to get a better understanding of this particular verse here in Mark 13 we read a parallel um, let me think here for a second I apologize uh, I'm not prepared where's the parallel at give me a second here there it is 14 but when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. All right, and a parallel in Luke 21 will be, let me find it here. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, <clears throat> excuse me, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So let me read those consecutively. So <clears throat> you might get a better understanding. I want to make this real simple. I, because it is real simple. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, when you shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Alright, so, number one, I think it's important to understand the English language, okay, and then to understand the words. Uh, the word desolation, a state of complete emptiness or destruction. All right, so this can only mean one thing. And that is the absence of the Spirit of God. The void uh, of being, uh, I'm sorry, void of the Spirit of God. And the abomination is... The void of the Spirit of God. All right, so it's a place where the Spirit of God is not. All right, it's that simple. Now, here's the thing. Uh, yeah, I don't think you have to make any more out of it than that right there. All right, now, it's interesting here. When ye, when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies all right it's Jerusalem in the Middle East 
or is Jerusalem above? All right. I want you to think about that. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 9. And I believe he said verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice in oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate. Even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. The desolate in Daniel 9 is means those that do not have the Spirit of God. Those that are unsaved. All right. Deserted of people. And in a state of bleak and dismal emptiness. All right, so this is in reference to unsaved people, people that do not have the Spirit of God, people that are not born of God. Now, I'm going to give you an example here that this gentleman here, 7 7 Saint, 7 7 Post Trip, he's not saved. Because he does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ by his own statement. His own words condemn himself. He is calling Jesus the Antichrist. You see it right here. By his own words. His number one abomination of desolation is the revealing of Antichrist. Daniel 9, verse 27. Now he's claiming that this is the Antichrist. And that's incredible to make that statement so bold. Hey, Jesus is the Antichrist incredible how many devils there are in the world today and of course I already know that he didn't get this from anywhere but another devil who also did not believe does not believe all right and this is when you've heard me talk about I will choose their delusions in what is Isaiah 65 Five. Uh, just pardon me. I'm guessing. 66. In Isaiah 66, verse 4, I will choose, I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. So this guy, 7-7 seven, seven, Saint, 7-7 seven, seven Post Trib, he's, he's scared. He's afraid. No, oh, the Antichrist is going to come. When <laughs> that's the Antichrist is already here. You're afraid of something that's never going to happen. And you're blind to the reality of the situation right now and the Word of God is telling us but you're not listening you're not believing the Bible that you hold in your hands and because you don't believe God will choose your delusion and this is an example of it I want I want you to see something here I want you to pay attention now I mean, anybody that cares about the truth ought to already know this. Hebrews 8, verse 6, But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So who did this? That's Jesus. 
Daniel chapter 9, and he shall confirm the covenant, the better covenant based on better promises. And in the midst of the week, he shall lay down his life as the appropriation. Well, let me see if I can find this. He is the appropriation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, he laid down his life. Alright, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Not possible. Alright, it's only by the blood of Jesus. Okay. Now here, Jesus, he is the one that laid down his life. He is the one that sacrificed his body. He is the one that makes an end of sins. He is the one that causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease because he laid down his life once for all. Let me see if I can find this verse here. By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. See, he's the one that causes sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Even until the consummation. And the consummation is the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump we will be changed into our glorified bodies we will take off this corruptible body and put on incorruption we will take off this mortal body and put on immortality Con uh, consummation the action of making a marriage or relationship complete by well never mind that last part but it is true that we, the church, is, um, how, do, how do I say this? Let's go, let me do it this way. All right. I have a funny way of looking at things here. So, no, nope, not going to be good enough here. In Revelation 19, verse 9, right? Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper is when we are married with Jesus. We are essentially married with God. Like I said, we are changed, transformed into our glorified body. That's the consummation. All right, so he has done all this made an end of sins and caused these things to cease even until he returns in the clouds of heaven and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate that's the wrath of god being poured upon the unsaved and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory this is prophesied all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation so you got no excuse now if you don't believe then you're going to be delusional and imagine that Jesus is the Antichrist it's insanity it's pure insanity. This is the world that we're living in. And this is what all the preachers preach in your community churches today. They're all insane. They're all out of their mind. And none of them believe God. Now, if 
you have eyes to see, it should be very simple. All right, so the angel comes to Daniel and says, hey, consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. Who does that? Is it Jesus or is it the Antichrist? And to make reconciliation for iniquity. Is that Jesus or is that the Antichrist? And to bring in everlasting righteousness. Again, is that Jesus or is that the Antichrist? And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Who's the most holy? Is it Jesus or the Antichrist? You still can't figure out what this is about? <laughs> Consider the vision. Know therefore and understand that from going forth to the commandment to the restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, which is Jesus, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. This is Jesus coming into our body and sacrificing his body, which is our body, and then rebuilding it into a perfect body. All right. So we that are followers of Jesus... We will follow him where he has gone. So Jesus came into our flesh. God manifest in the flesh. He laid down his life. He was in the grave. And then he took up his life. Resurrected. And then ascended to heaven. And we that follow him will do the same. We'll go into the grave. We'll be lifted up. Resurrected. And then ascend to heaven. To meet the Lord. In the excuse me, in the air, all right? Just as we read. Numerous places, uh, specifically 1 Thessalonians 4. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we will be lifted up into the air to meet the Lord and so shall we ever be with the Lord and this is prophesied all, all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation all throughout the Bible there's really no excuse there's really no excuse at all and that this is the this is exactly what this verse is talking about and even the Jews did not understand it and it's talked about in the Bible. If I can figure out where it was at. If I can remember. Just give me a second here. Give me a second here. I got to think about this. One second. One second. Give me a second here. I might be one chapter off. And I am. Of course. Let me scroll down, scroll up, kind of go in between and find something here. Yeah, yeah, even the Jews, they didn't understand Daniel chapter 9. They didn't understand when Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, 40 and 6 years was this temple and building. Well, thou reared up in three days. But he spake of the temple of his body. Jesus destroyed the temple and then rebuilt it into a perfect temple. We are in this temple, this body of ours. But Jesus has made a better temple for us. And we will receive that better temple after we've gone the path that he has led for us, which is into the grave and up into the air. And when we meet him up in the air, we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. 
And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah, that's Jesus. It's still Jesus. It never changes. Messiah is always Jesus. But if you're calling the Antichrist your Messiah, you got problems, man. By your own words. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. But not for himself. Not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. But not for himself. See, he shall be cut off, killed, but not for himself. And the people of the prince, that's the Jews, shall come and destroy, kill Jesus shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's talking about the temple that Jesus laid down his life, the body. So in John chapter 2, when Jesus says, destroy this temple, they thought he was talking about the buildings when in fact he was talking about the body. And that's really the most important thing that needs to be destroyed and rebuilt that's why we put our hope into a savior that's why Jesus has come to save us and the end thereof shall be with a flood in the end of the war desolations are determined judgments coming and he shall confirm again Jesus shall confirm the covenant better covenant based on better promises all right in the, in the midst of the week and then after three days he rose out of the grave he is resurrected and ultimately ascended to heaven that's plain as day man what it's incredible oh no Reverend Schmidt he says that's the Antichrist Oh well, Reverend Schmidt, he's not saved, is he? He's a he's a wolf in sheep's clothing, and you got no excuse, man. Number one, if you just read, if you just believed the the plainly written word of God, you wouldn't have any problem at all. But here again, we're being warned and warned over and over and over about these guys. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Anybody that calls the Antichrist the Messiah, that's, I think it's fair to call that person a wolf. Obviously, they are blind. They can't see because they do not believe. And this is all, you know, there are several examples. I, I think uh, really uh, the Pharaoh having his heart hardened is a really good example. But I'm going to go to uh, uh, well, out of somewhere, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away because these guys they don't believe even when they read it they can't see it they can't understand it because the veil is upon their heart another great example that i love um i don't know if i'll be able to find it or not but let me try. Let me go right here. Verse 43. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. He's standing right in front of these guys. And right in front of them. And he's talking right to them. They can't understand what he's saying. And Jesus says, even because you cannot hear my word, it's because they don't believe, because they don't believe, they will not understand. 
That's a, it's it's incredible, really. But it's consistent with everything that we know about the Bible, the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And uh, excuse me, did I say that right? The Word of God is qu is sh quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And of the joints of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. The Word of God is, it's not just words, man. It's a phenomenon. There's something very spiritual about the Word of God. And you think about it. The Bible that you hold in your hands, that's the Word of God. If you don't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands, you don't believe the Word of God. You don't believe the Word of God, you don't believe God. And so that's why... I strongly encourage people to believe the Bible that they hold in their hands. You know, so many preachers today are saying, no, you can't trust that Bible. You have to go to this imaginary Bible that I have access to and I can translate for you. But you can't trust that Bible that you hold in your hands. Well, if you can't trust that Bible you hold in your hands, you can't trust God. You have to put your trust in man. And because you put your trust in man... You deserve to be delusional. All right, and it's I think I think it's evidence that you're not saved because you don't believe God, you believe man. Anyways, uh, you know very clearly. The, I mean, the, the, how in the world? The, there's only one way to somehow imagine that the Antichrist is the Messiah, and that is if a false preacher a wolf comes to you and explains it to you in a way that twists everything around makes you imagine something that's not there and because you don't believe the written word of god you're going to believe the wolf all right well the greek and the hebrew says this means that and that means this and everything you read is nothing all right, i mean come on man Seven seven saint seven seven postrium. If you really are born of God, how is it possible that you could get this deceived to believe that the Messiah is the Antichrist? The whole vision, the whole entire vision that the angel says, consider the vision, the whole vision is about the Lord Jesus Christ making an end of sins, making reconciliation for iniquity, and bringing in everlasting righteousness. That's the whole purpose of the vision and the fulfillment that will take place, which is revealed all throughout the New Testament. This whole thing is revealed in the New Testament. Your idea of an Antichrist Making a covenant is not at all in the New Testament. It's not anywhere at all. The abomination of desolation is people that do not have the Spirit of God. All right. I don't want to get off track, but... It's not rocket science right there. It's not rocket science at all. Matthew 24, verse 21, the great tribulation, time of tribulation with the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. All right, so and I know what Matthew 24, 21 says, and it doesn't say, it doesn't say Antichrist, it doesn't say mark of the beast. You're just making that stuff up. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. This is, we are in tribulation right now. The, this great tribulation is this world. It's very clear. It's very clear. And if you, you, you pose anything else, you're just dumb and you're wrong and I'm gonna show it to you all right in the world you shall have tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world 
This is Jesus saying, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. All right, you, you see it, man? You see in it? Tribulation. In the world you shall have tribulation. You see it? In the world you shall have tribulation. In the world we will see great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, and except those days shall be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, consider the context of what we're reading here and what Jesus is talking about. The context is the disciples asking Jesus, what shall be the sign of his coming and of the end of the world? That's kind of that's key right there. The world. It's kind of important. The world. So when we read great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, or nor ever shall be. It's talking about this world. And this world is growing worse and worse and worse to a point where if God allowed things to play out the way they are, there would be no flesh saved. That's this world. It's increasingly wicked. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And of course we can draw parallels to the time we're in now with the time in the days of Noah right before the flood came. We can draw parallels for sure. Now that there's, a, there's some, I guess, slight differences. No question about it. Slight differences in the sense that in the days of Noah men were living much longer. Right? And they had every opportunity they could ever ask for to do it on their on their own, to do it themselves, and they blew it. They blew it big time. They screwed it up seven ways to Sunday. And so now uh, things have changed, right? We don't live as long, and we've been given the law, and we've had God come into our flesh and lead the way for us so we really we've got no excuse now okay we can't do it on our own they couldn't do it on their own in the days of Noah they needed a savior and God saved Noah his three sons and their wives eight souls were saved so also Jesus will save us that are born of the Spirit of God. Those of us that are His people. Alright? But, there is, will not be very many people alive when Jesus comes. I'm sorry, alive and saved at the same time. If God let things play out the way they are, there would be nobody alive and saved. So when we read about the great tribulation, it's the increase of wickedness in this world. In the world he shall tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. This thing about Antichrist, Mark of the Beast, is simply not here in verse 21. You're just imagining stuff again because Reverend Smitty Wolf the Reverend Wolf planted something in your brain and you believed it Matthew 24 29 
through 31, immediately after the tribulation, Jesus returns and gathers together all the righteous. Oh, okay. When Jesus brings the kingdom of heaven to the earth. Wait, no, 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 no. That's not what it says. You didn't even read it, did you? You didn't even read Matthew 24. It says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, that's Jesus, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Why? Why are all the tribes of the earth mourning? Now that's that's kind of important to understand. I mean, it's really important. It's very important. Why are all the tribes of the earth mourning? And this is this is hold on a second. This is very very important. In Luke twenty one, it says men's hearts failing them for fear. People are having heart attacks. Why? When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven but if look if they're gonna have a thousand bonus years of all kinds of stinky sexual activities isn't that what you're saying repopulate oh you said it nicer than I do you say it real nice repopulate that you say it nice what I call that I call that stinky sweaty sex Stinky sex. That's what it is. Ba it's, this whole doctrine is based on this stinky sex. And we're warned about that. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Right? They're imagining, hey, Jesus comes. you got 1,000 years to uh, believe in him. You don't have to believe now. You can wait. You can wait until after Jesus comes. Right? Isn't that what you're saying? Or are you going to say, no, all the unsaved are killed, but the saved are going to have babies. So we're going to be in our glorified body. You're going to be like you're 20 years old again. And you're going to be having sex with other saved... What? Women? Is that it? Because there are no more unsaved people. So we're going to be changed into our glorified body, according to you, and then we're going to be having sex with other people? Well, I got a couple things. Maybe you didn't know that Jesus was asked, um, well, I don't want to get into, I want to make this short. Hold on a second. In the resurrection. I mean, if you don't know the story, buddy, just better start reading the Bible and stop talking. Really. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So there is no marriage after we're resurrected. So there's no marriage. So there's no marriage, but there's just stinky, slimy sex. Steamy, stinky, sweaty, slimy sex. No marriage, just people having willy-nilly free sex all over the place. Everybody dry humping everybody, I don't know, whatever. Well, that's contrary to what Jesus Christ says. Jesus says, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. That means there is no more sex. All right, and then of course John... He writes it as plain as day. Plain as day. John says, so, I love this, man. John, I love this. Ever since the first time I read it, I loved it. touched my soul. I'll never forget it. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. 
If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abides for ever. Love this. Right here, John makes it very clear that when Jesus comes, the end of the world, the lusts are done away with. There is no more sex. There is no more lusting. Now we can go back to the very beginning of the steamy, stinky, slimy sex, sweaty sex. And realize that, hey, this is a curse that God put on Adam and Eve because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this curse will be done away with along with all the evil when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and stomps his foot on the head of the serpent. Destroying all, all this stuff, this... Um, because they did this, right? I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. All right, so we know that there will be no more sorrow, neither will there be any more sex, and there nobody will be getting married or be given in marriage. Right? All that's going to be done away with. And all this stinky sex stuff is just a curse because of what Adam and Eve done. And that curse will be um, done away with forever when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven on the great and terrible day of the Lord. All right. Okay, so this idea that you, you're gonna have, you're gonna be transformed into your 20-year-old body and just hot dogging it all over the place—that's not gonna happen. That's really it reveals where your heart is, doesn't it? This idea, yeah, the youth of every nation. We're gonna be willy-nilly. Just doesn't make any sense. It's weird, man. It's it stinks of Mormonism. It really, it's almost, it's almost, almost like a, a cross between Mormonism and Catholicism. It's weird. Either way, it's not in the Bible. It's not biblical at all. Okay. All right. So the, let me think here. So let me go back to this point to where men's hearts failing them for fear, right? And all the tribes of the earth mourn. And then, of course, in Revelation chapter 1, don't skip chapter 1. It's very important. If you're going to read the book of Revelation, read chapter 1. Otherwise, you miss out. You might get confused. You might not understand. In chapter 1, it says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. That means the dead people. All the living and the dead will come up out of their graves. All and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, all kindreds of the earth shall wail. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. And men's hearts failing them for fear. Why? Why? Because they know it's the end of the world. And now, when it's the end of the world, it's not going to be like it is now. Not even close. Not even close. Revelation 21. Verse 5, and he that sat upon the throne, that's Jesus, says, Behold, I make all things new. 
And I'm going to go back to stinky sex, man. You're worrying about your girlfriend cheating on you. Worrying about your wife cheating on you. You worry about you cheating on your wife and girlfriend. And all this stinky, slimy, you know, stuck. I mean, come on, man. Get me out of this wickedness. Get me out of this filthy sex. Bro, I don't know. I mean, you got him. Me and you are not on the same planet, buddy. Repopulate the planet. Well, I got news for you. I got news for you. We're not even on a planet, Jack. We're not even on a planet. That right there is. I don't even get started on that. Don't even want to get started on that. Don't even want to get started on when Jesus brings the kingdom of heaven to the earth, begins his thousand year rule with his kings and priests. Now, again, let's go back real quick. Oh, he's going to bring some kings and priests. In. Well, if you read Revelation chapter 1, you'd realize right now we are kings and priests unto God right now. We that are born of God are the kings and priests unto God and then you know I'd like to I'd like to say well this is what happens when you don't read the Bible you don't know stuff you don't understand stuff well so it's much more than that it's much much more than that it's much more than that because these people that preach these things that teach these things they don't not only are they ignorant of it they don't believe it they don't believe it, they don't understand it, because they're not saved. They're not one of us. And the, we're warned about these people over and over and over and over and over. In, Acts, in, in uh, Exodus 19, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now remember, Jesus comes and he says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. In First Peter chapter 2. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal generation priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. They should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We are the people of God. We are the chosen, the elect. We are the children of of God the children of Israel the promises to Abraham and his seed were to Christ and if you be Christ then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise all right so this I this idea of a future I mean you're essentially saying you are not a priest of God you are not a king of God you do not sit on heavenly thrones with those of us that are uh, born of God right In Ephesians 2 we he has raised us up together has right now raised us up together and made and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now right now we're saved you're making this out to be well you're not saved now but in the future blah, 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 blah. who being who are being ruled over what are you talking about you just said something and then you're asking me to answer your statement your statement's not supported by the Bible who are the survivors on the planet from every nation Number one, we're not a we're not on a planet, Jack. This is fairy tale, comic book stuff, man. What are you talking about? All the mark takers are killed. Revelation nineteen. Who's left? The youth of every nation. What are you talking about? 
those that did not take the mark yet were not saved. Oh, so, okay, so in your fairy tale, in your comic book, you got young people, young girls, all right, young girls who don't take the mark, so they survive the the end of the world. They survive the fire. Uh, you know, I've been watching these uh, uh, a few videos of the storm surge uh, from the hurricanes in the last couple of weeks down in Florida, and the water is like ten feet tall, and it's moving fast, and the winds are horrendous. And I, th I'm just can't, I can't help but think of the similarities between that and the days of Noah, and how unsurvivable those conditions are. And you know, it, for the the hurricanes, there are a couple of days maybe of that sort of condition where the waters are uh, way up, and then the winds are are uh, tremendous. You know couple of days. One of the days of Noah was a lot longer. There's, It's not survivable at all. I mean, everybody's going to be dead in the first 15 minutes. There's no way people can survive that. If you've, if you've seen uh, any of the recent videos, you know what I'm talking about. You know that that's an unsurvivable situation. To be in the water you know away from you know anything now you could survive it of course if you're bunkered up or whatever for a couple of days but what happened in the days of Noah was much more extreme much more but just from that little bit of time period it's unsurvivable to be outdoor and to be in the water there's no way you can survive with the wind and the water's flying it's devastating now this world and nobody survived the flood of Noah only eight souls survived right now this world is reserved unto fire all right so it's not going to be destroyed by water can be destroyed by something that's even more harmful more devastating the whole world is going to be on fire and it's not just going to be hot it's going to destroy make everything melt and not just you know the grass and the trees and the buildings and this and that. it's gonna burn up heaven and earth consider this the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat the elements will melt with fervent heat I mean it's gonna get hot hot unlike anything we've ever felt I don't care where you're from this is devastation beyond devastation the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up not just the earth but the works all the works and that includes the childbearing you know the people getting married sorrow and sin and all wickedness will be burned up. And that's, as a Christian, as a born-again, Bible-believing, born-of-God Christian, that's what I'm putting my hope into is a new world, a better world, that is void of all, these, all, all this wickedness that we experience in this world, including hot, stinky sex. I don't want no part of it. And if you disagree, then you're not one of us. Because there won't be stinky sex. You think it's great? Look at all the devastation that it's doing. It's breaking people's hearts. 
every day. It's devastating. Yeah, it helps bring life. That's that's a good thing. Absolutely. There's a it's great on one hand and it's horrible on the other hand. All right, let's do away with it. And God will do away with it. It won't be necessary any longer. The world that we have waiting for us is much greater than the world that we're in now. Just like I read in John, 1 John chapter 2, love not the world. So why do you love the world? If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What part don't you understand, right? All right, so seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to the promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Right? We read the same thing in Revelation 21, don't we? The same thing in Revelation 21. New heavens, Oops. and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And new Jerusalem comes down from from God out of heaven. So we're putting our hope into this. In John 14, my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. All the mark, everybody that is not born of God has the mark of the beast. Right? Everybody that worships uh, polit uh, politicians, they all are worshiping the beast. All right. Now, can I do this? I don't want to. I don't want to reveal all my private stuff here All right, here here you go politics for beginners All right politics for beginners you got right wing you got left wing right wing left wing All right. there's your politics for beginners right so all of us that are born of God, we have the mark of God. All right. All of us that are born of God. I gotta think now. I gotta think because I want you to put your eyes on it. Oh, forgive me a second. Forgive me. Uh, give me a second here. I gotta think. What is this that I'm looking for? Saying, "Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God." in their foreheads so this is not the mark of the beast this is the mark of God in our foreheads all of us that are born of God are marked by God right we are sealed saved secured sanctified forever uh, at that moment when we are born of God all right so those that do that are not born of God, they have the mark of the beast because they're trusting government. If you look at this word beast as government, maybe it, for me personally, it makes it easier to understand. Because Daniel talks about four beasts until the end of the world, and he names the first three beasts. The king of Babylon, the kings of Medes and Persia, the king of Greek, Grecia. And then we know that the fourth beast is the Roman Empire. 
and therefore the fourth beast, and we know that the fourth beast of Daniel is the beast of Revelation. So the beast of Revelation has to be the Roman Empire. And of course the beast that was and is not and yet is, is the transformation from a physical empire into a spiritual empire known today as the Roman Catholic Church. All right, and so any man that worships the beast is, you, well, the the beast the uh, causes. Uh, oh my goodness, I I wasn't going to get into this, but it, because the Roman Catholic Church causes all the unsaved people basically to worship the first beast, which is the physical empire. Uh, let me see if I, I was gonna. Oh, I need to be wrapping this up. All right, I'm going into a full body, a full Bible study here. That's not my intent. I just talk and talk and talk until the coffee runs out. Uh, and then the dwell to worship the first beast. All right, so right there it is, Revelation 13. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. The first beast being the physical. Roman Empire, right, and this, he, the second, uh, being the Roman Catholic Church, causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, which would be where whatever country that you're in, it would be your government. So if you're in the United States, it would be, you know, uh, people like Obama and Trump, and you know, and all the the administrations, the Republicans, Democrats, all of them, right. And whose deadly wound was healed, and the, that deadly wound was the transformation of the physical into the spiritual. Okay, that's all that is. It's pretty cool. It's pretty simple. How amazingly accurate and descriptive the Book of Revelation is. It's, I love it. I love it. But um, at the same time, I find it odd that. And this is not just the way I see things and you see things differently and another person sees. No, this is the absolute truth. And if you don't see it, there's a reason for it. You're not one of us. There is no other explanation for this. The truth is the truth. The truth is not subjective at all. If you don't see the truth, then there's a reason for it. All right. All right. So what was I going to... Okay, so the mark, you're worried about the mark? <laughs> I mean... To bring, yeah, I will bring their fears upon them because they don't believe. When I called, none did answer. All right, so seven seven saint seven seven post trib. Let me encourage you to believe the Bible that you hold in your hands. Believe that it comes directly from God, because it does. And that's the key to understanding the Word of God, is faith. Without faith, you can't understand any of it, even as you read it, even as the Lord Jesus Christ stands in front of you and speaks it to you. Without faith, you can't hear it, you can't understand any of it. Faith. Man, it, it's always been about faith 